consider Muslims to be terrorists. And I don't think historically that's an accurate construct. As I said, Irish Catholics, German communists, um, Latin American uh, Christian. These, you know, terrorism does not have one particular thing. It, it is unfortunate that this is something that is somehow gripped the popular imagination. But I want to address this further. When you go to the United States, and I hope you guys get a chance to travel to the United States. Has anyone here been to the U.S.? Yes? Okay, great. Two people. Three people. Excellent. Why haven't the rest of you been? What? People are trading uh, security issues, like uh, students now want to uh, lock an increasing account uh, regarding US and U uh, UK and other European countries because people are, uh, students are trading uh, after 9-11, there are the uh, people's uh, US uh, trading uh, not well as security issues, that's why students are trading yeah. to US. Yeah, sure. I, I gotta say, I know lots of people, I just spoke to 50 students yesterday who are going to the United States, they will not have a problem. Someone may can mistake them for Hispanic and speak Spanish to them, but they will not be persecuted because of any perception of being Muslim or Pakistani. And honestly speaking, only 20% of Americans even have a passport, so most of us don't even travel internationally. A lot of people don't even know where Pakistan is on the map. Americans will not know as much about your country as you will know about their country. It's just part of it is economics, part of it is geographic. You know, we are we have two giant oceans. My brother was supposed to visit. Uh, I went. My, my mother is British and. I was supposed to go, uh, for Thanksgiving I went to, to London to meet some of my family there. My brother has two kids and he just couldn't afford $4,000 to go round trip for a weekend for Thanksgiving. So a lot of people don't travel. It's, it's an economic problem more than anything else. We have Mexico and Canada and such a big diverse country with so much to go that there's a lot, you know, it's not that, uh, is, there's not that much demand to travel. So, so I, I'm sort of pre-apologizing for my countrymen's uh, lack of knowledge about Pakistan. But if you do go to America, and I do hope you do, you won't have this problem. I was home for six weeks this summer. I was living in New York City where my family lives. And, you know, I'm on the subway. There's women in hijabs. There's, there's guys, you know, every, there's everybody from everywhere there. You can find halal food in the grocery store. There's 2,200 mosques in America. Okay, over 2,000 mosques in America, in every neighborhood, whether it's a rural Georgia community or, you know, Detroit. You go, to, you go to Detroit, you go to Dearborn, Michigan, and you'll find one of the biggest halal areas in a Walmart you'll ever see. It's like literally rows and rows of halal food. All right, that was question one. Muslims are not terrorists. Let me get to question two. So, I think you need to take a, it's a very simplistic statement to say the United States supported the Taliban in Afghanistan because... The Taliban as it existed were not supported, but you need to dial back history, okay, and look at the Mujahideen and look at what was happening. There was an illegal invasion, and, and, and to address, sorry, the second part of your first question, terrorism by definition is done by non-state actors. Now, state violence against a minority group or a breakaway group or something like that is not by definition terrorism. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean you can just call it terrorism or call it socialism or call it Nazism. I mean, people do this all the time. They, they bandy about these terms, but just because something is negative doesn't mean you can smear it by some other negative term. Uh, and I, I think you need to be very careful in your language when you do that. You say, oh, this is terrorism. I don't like it. My brother beat me up. It's terrorism. It's not. Okay? It's, and it's a very specific political science term, and, and really look into it. So second question you had there, the United States did with Pakistan in 19... 80s work on sponsoring indigenous groups to repel the illegal invasion by the Soviets of Afghanistan. That did happen. What happened in the intervening, what, 20 some odd years is very complicated. And, and really, you know, the simplistic, it's, it's not as though it, it, it's it really, it's a very, I, it's, I, you do a whole class on this. You do a whole semester on the development of Taliban from, from that time to, to this. And there's a lot of different factors and a lot of different influences and events that occurred. So to say, hey, you supported the Taliban, what the hell? I mean, it's not really uh, an academically coherent argument. Before 9-11, there is no terrorism in Pakistan, like Waziristan and Dawat. Okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm here to answer whatever questions you have. I, I really would in, in, encourage you to look through and, and 
see the kinds of resources that were put into the groups that then fought as proxies in Afghanistan in the 90s and, and just take a look at that and see what happened there because it's not a very simple picture. There's a lot of different forces and a lot of different influences there. It's, it's, it's not clear cut as America did this and Pakistan did this. It's not. There's, there's a lot of different actors in there. Anyway, please. Uh, there's a couple of different books. Yes. Yeah, uh, I would like to talk about a historical event which was done by the Bush government, not yours. Uh, there's there's a, even a movie about it. Uh, it's like the name of the movie is The Fair Game. It's about an event where a diplomat said something about the Iraq weapons of mass destruction, and it was incorrectly portrayed to the U.S. people and the public on the media. And when I saw that, I was like, I was really impressed by those people who made up that movie, brought up the issue, and convinced the American people that they, those people were lying to you. But at the end of the day, I imagine that what has happened to the George W. Bush, who was lying to the government, who was lying to the people. I mean, he killed millions of people, I don't know, or maybe less than a million in Iraq. And that guy is still wearing a suit and having fun and going here and there. So who's going to, you know, who's going to execute him? I mean, who's going to take, gonna take care of that person? Just to clarify, I'm a professional diplomat. I, I'm not politically appointed. Uh, the way that our diplomatic service works is we take a test and we serve whatever administration is in power. Uh, and so the reason behind, reasoning behind that is that we're less swayable by what you just talked about, the political responsibilities. And I have to say, that is an excellent movie. I have seen it. Uh, I used to work for, for Colin Powell when, he first, uh, when I was first uh, joining, joining the service. And a lot of people in America were, you know, the, the, it, what happened, the events of September 11th were a very difficult time in the United States. It was the first attack on domestic soil since, uh, by a foreign power, I think since, since the 1800s, since our Civil War, anyway. Um, and, and you're asking really two questions is, you know, how, how could this happen? Uh, you know, it's, you, you, the United States, we're very trusting of those in power and, and, uh, you know, there's, the portrayal is that somehow everybody went along quietly, and I don't think that's true. I think if you look at what happened in 2000 in Florida with the election that George W. Bush won, but he didn't really win, you know, half the country has been more or less opposed to him for the entire tenure of his election. And then when he won re-election, there was a lot of shady stuff going on in Ohio with the votes, and, you know, there, there was this constant undercurrent of opposition to George W. Bush, his government, and some of the things he did. And, and I, I think one thing that is not portrayed accurately in the media here, and not just here, everywhere in the world, is that the United States is not a monolith. There are many voices. There's huge debate. I worked for John Kerry in Bali for the climate change conference in 2007. And prior to that, you know, as a diplomat, you're assigned to foreign visiting dig dignitaries, or your, 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 sorry, your domestic d dignitaries when they come, or foreign ones. I mean, you're just sort of given an assignment. When President Bakiyev of Kyrgyzstan came to UN General Assembly, I had to take him around for three days and show him New York. I mean, so you sort of get these random assignments. Well, one of mine was, was John Kerry. This was during Bush power. And I had been working for the Bush delegation, or the, his representatives, uh, Paula Dobriansky, who's the Under Secretary of State for Environment and Global Affairs, and as soon as I met with Kerry, I said, well, sir, what, what, is, what is your agenda here? He says, you know what you've been doing for the last week? I said, yeah. He says, I want you to do the exact opposite for the next three days. We are going to oppose the Bush people. We're going to do X, Y, Z, you know. And he just, he was there to fight. Uh, and, and I think this, this doesn't get conveyed accurately, that there's a healthy legislative debate. I mean, what's going on right now with the debt ceiling? There, right now, the Obama administration is under extreme pressure from Congress to change its policies on Pakistan, on domestic things, on health care, on what we, you know, how we manage our sovereign debt, all these kinds of things. So I think this debate, I mean, we were aware of this debate at the time, and there were lots of people who did not believe, and I have to say the State Department was the one agency. We have, I think, 16 or 17 different anal intelligence analysis units within the U.S. government. You know, like you have your different uh, branches of the service. And, and, the United, and the State Department, we don't do intelligence, but we do analysis. And our analysis unit, the INR, which it is Intelligence and Research, came out with an opposite opinion to what you're talking about and said, hey, there are no weapons of mass destruction. Going into Iraq is a mistake. And we presented that. Okay. 
And you know, so so these voices these voices do exist. Now to answer the second part, there's also something we have called executive privilege. I mean, it's very rare that a president is prosecuted for anything either post or during. Now a lot of people a lot of people lost their job and faced criminal prosecution over the outing of Valerie Plame. Uh, and there, there have been some administration officials like Scooter Libby and some of the people around Dick Cheney who have been prosecuted and some of the lobbyists, uh, Dick Abramoff, who's currently serving jail time. So, so there are some people who did some things that were ethically questionable and are being punished for it. But to answer your question, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Okay, we, we have Kurutelen Eni from the MESCOM department. Uh, one question for, uh, regarding your speech. You said that uh, U.S. and Pakistan both con uh, both uh, believe on freedom of thought and freedom of expression. So why Afia Siddiqui was uh, were arrested only on the only on the behalf of uh, uh, political thoughts? Because we all know that uh, only not only one violation of law uh, was uh, uh, proved on her. And my second question is, U.S. government has repeatedly uh, declaring that uh, they give us two, uh, more than $2 billion for the assistance of Pakistan. While Pakistani government uh, was uh, in last budget uh, declaring that only $190 billion has been received. So if you are spending money on your own behalf and sweet wills, then why you are calling it as assistance of Pakistan? Um, to answer your first question, I'm not a legal expert, but I have read the court transcripts of the Afia Siddiqui case, and I encourage everyone to read them. And there is some... The American judicial system is skewed towards the defendant. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Ms. Siddiqui chose to forgo legal counsel, which is a statement that, which is a tactic used by people who are either very, very guilty and do not want to fight and make things worse for themselves or are not sound in mind and body. And, and, but she chose not to use an insanity defense. And, and I, I found it very unusual that someone would choose to, forg for, for, would choose to forgo legal counsel on this. Uh, take a look at the transcripts of it and take a look at I mean, she, she makes a full confession to a whole bunch of things. Uh, and I don't think this was accurately portrayed in the Pakistani media at the time. I was here, there were a lot of protests, uh, but I really don't think that this was an accurate portrayal of what actually happened in that courtroom. Uh, and also, she, I mean, there was a long history of, of, of things that she had done and, and her associations that are, that are quite proven. Uh, in terms of the assistance, assistance is very complicated. And I would encourage you to read an article that appeared in last week's dawn.com that was titled, What Has America Done for Pakistan? And it details, through over, over the course of history, the various aid and the various projects. And some of them are in kind, and some of them are, are straight fiscal. Yes. Our topic is Pakistan uh, and U.S. relationship. So uh, my question is, why America, uh, American army attacked Pakistan in the form of drone bomb blast? Do you realize? How many innocent people are died in one bomb blast? Or so, do you, realize, do you realize this is a big issue, maintaining good relation between Pakistan and the uh, U.S.? I encourage you to read WikiLeaks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I have nothing for you on that question. Okay. From there. From okay. okay. Honorable Diplomat Mr. Bay, uh, as you said uh, in your speech that um, uh, Pakistan and America have the same historical uh, uh, background and uh, the cultural ties by the mutual in interest. Uh, but my question is why from the State Department after one or two weeks there is a report that Pakistan is a failed state? I have not seen that report. Do you know what it's called? Pakistan is a failed uh, Pakistan is a failed And that we published, the State Department published that? I would be very surprised. And from, and from, we have a lot of and, reports, and from, but I don't and know from, that one. And from American media. Okay. American I, media. I will look it up, but I'm pretty sure, look, I would have known if we published, that's not what we were. I know we do the Religious Freedom Report, we do the Trafficking Persons Report, we do the uh, Human Rights Report, but I do not ever remember seeing anything crossing my desk or my email that said Pakistan is a failed state. I will take a look at it. It's probably a think tank. It's probably not anyone, actually, actually the State Department. That sounds... Look, there are 
bold diplomats and old bold diplomats, but no old bold diplomats. People don't people don't write statements like that from the State Department. That is that's kind of out there. But I'll check I'll check it out. I'm sure I'll Google it. I'm sure it's from a think tank or an article from a journalist. Mr. Perry is behind the bold people today, so I, I am worried about that. Please. Knowledge from mass communication department. A question is, a great criticism has been seen from U.S. and Pakistan ISI. At the same time, they are in consistent meetings with General Shija Pasha. So what's going on under the table? And my second question is again on drone attacks. If you want to answer, then should I continue? You can ask. <laughs> you said that suicide bombers are being produced in Pakistan religious schools, consistent drone attacks on Pakistani land. A 12 year killed who has lost his family in drone attack. We can't expect him to be a patriotic Pakistani. He will definitely join Taliban or other militia. But then there should be some other way to kill that ter terrorist in Pakistan without the loss of innocent lives. Okay, on your first question. On your first question, I'm really sorry, this is very unsatisfying. And you can keep asking me the same question, and I can keep giving you the same response. Um, I can't tell you about General Pasha or Panetta or Petraeus or Kiani. I can talk to you about, uh, well, it was Bashir, but now it's, it's, it's Ms. Hina and Clinton and Holbrook and you know I, the, the people I work with, which are the State Department folks. So I, I, I don't know what goes on in those other meetings. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, can, I, can, I have information and can talk knowledgeably about when Clinton visits here or Kerry visits here, because I tend to be in those meetings. Um, on the other part, again, WikiLeaks, and I have, no, I have nothing for you. Sorry. There's a lot of information out there, but okay. Is there any question that dis that is new okay. and different and talks about the people? Just a minute, just a minute, from this side. So you gave a great speech on Pakistan. Some more questions. That 